Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon. We're Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? All right. First of all, I want to welcome everyone to what you'll see is going to be two wonderful presentations. And just to kind of give us some context to how we got here, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, President Dr. Sue Henderson, who had the foresight to charge two task forces. One was shared governance, and the other was the civility task force. And um, I'm just going to ask Dr. Henderson just to say a few words before I go into more discussion about why we're here and the presentations you're about to see. I want to thank you all so much. Uh, man, we, there are some seats up front. You, you don't have to be a task force member to sit there. Here, here. <laughs> just take their seats. Um, so I want to thank you so much. This is a result of the Great Colleges Survey, which we did two years ago. I think you're supposed to do them every three years. And they always want you, after you've done them, to look at what you did well, what you need to work on, and create these task forces. So the two of them that came out uh, had some great suggestions, and today you'll see the presentation on that. But um, as with most presidents, I cannot... Uh, not giving a little advertisement here, this morning the governor uh, and uh, the uh, secretary of our education did an announcement at William Patterson University because they started this fall something called the William Patterson Promise, which, by the way, is exactly like our debt-free promise. It has a few more bells and whistles around it in that they have a very robust um, orientation to college class. They do a lot with, it, with uh, helping them financially. But it's very similar to our debt-free program in terms of the fact that students, uh, $65,000 or less, are effectively going to be able to go free or without debt. The point I'm making is that the governor is incredibly dedicated this next, next go-round. Uh, this next year will be the ramp-up the following year to making it so that if you come from a family income of $60,000 or less, that he wants to make it so that you go debt-free. The beauty of it for us, which will be very helpful, is that we are already in the discipline of doing that. So in terms of cash coming in the door, we'll actually get some more cash in the door. Some other institutions who haven't been planning for it will not benefit as nicely as, as we will. Um, we can use that you know, to help students even further, which I think is important. But the point I want to make to you is that they called out a few institutions, and we were one of them, where they were very proud of the work that we were doing to help our students. So I want to take the opportunity to thank you for the good work that you do. Uh, we end up in the news a lot because of good things that are going on, whether the work that the faculty are doing, the research they're doing, the community work that's being done. I met yesterday with the mayor. He's thrilled with what we're doing, uh, not only in the arts, but the stuff we're doing. We're trying to get the A. Harry Moore building uh, where they can move back in without it falling apart or finding them a better one. Uh, so I'm working very closely with Frank and Walker. But I'm staying between you and a very good presentation. So I want to thank everybody who was involved in it. Let's keep going on this one. I think it will help drive the new strategic plan. And um, I want to thank you for your work. Uh, it's, been, it's been a real uh, privilege and pleasure. And thanks, Donna, for coming back. She stayed. You were in, like, the caucuses for how long? Six months? Four. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Um, first, I'd like to just introduce some members of not just the task forces, but some other administrators who made this effort possible. So as Dr. Henderson said, um, about several years ago, we participated in a Great Colleges to Workforce survey. It was in two, first one was 2013, and several themes emerged, which um, enabled the administration to look deeper into our campus climate and ways in which we could improve communication and improve civility and among that other themes. Fast forward to 2018, I believe, we participated in the second version of the great colleges to work for, and then the administrator, administration noticed that there were several themes that kept emerging again. So of the many themes that emerged, um, the administration decided to pick two themes one was civility and shared governance and charge two task forces. Now, those two task forces had myself, for those of you who are watching live stream, I'm Aaron Asker, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. 
I was the champion, literally the champion for the shared governance, and I had very little to do with the shared governance task force, but I was the champion for the shared governance task force, and my colleague Jason Kroll was the champion for the civility task force. Also, I'd like to recognize Sue Gerber and um, Julia Basile, who were, what I say, our partners, and I'd say not just support staff, but our partners in allowing us to stay on track, allowing us to meet these critical deadlines. And um, so what you see, what you'll witness or hear today is the culmination of several months of hard work by two task forces, and I'll ask the chairs of those task forces to introduce their members. So today is the culmination of months of work, hard work, tough deliberation, and I am just fortunate and privileged to be a part of that conversation. So I just want to say thank you to the task forces, thank you to the support staff, thank you to Julia, and thank you to Sue who helped guide this effort. And with that, I just want to turn it over to, I think, the Civility Task Force to introduce their members and um, begin what I can promise to be a very thrilling and thought-provoking presentation because it was. So um, without further ado, I'd just like to turn it over to um, the chair of the Civility Task Force. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rob Aslanian. Uh, you got it? There you go. All right, thanks. My name is Rob Aslanian. I'm co-chair of the Civility Task Force. We have a great crowd today. That's fantastic. So here is our, here is our committee. Uh, again, I'm Rob Aslanian. I'm co-chair. Ellen Quinn is the other co-chair. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge and introduce the people from the committee. Now, we're going to tag team this presentation today, so you'll see some of the people come up here and speak. But the ones who don't, uh, E. Ding. Stand, thank you. Randy Fontenay. Fontenay, sorry. Andrew Glakowski. Nancy Gomez. And Mohammed Sheikh. So there, um, and, and Ellen Quinn. I, I do have to thank Ellen, because Ellen was really the, the heart and soul of the committee, and she really drove us uh, to do this. So, what's the genesis of this, of this committee? So, as you heard already, there was the Great Colleges to Workforce surveys, and there were two of them, 2013 and 2018. And what was noticed is that there was a serious erosion in the sense of civility uh, amongst faculty, staff, and administration. So the administration wanted to address this, this issue, and they formed our committee. And we were given a charge, and here's our charge. So, we were asked to define what is meant by civility, and then to determine what strategies would enhance civility at NJCU. And how are we going to go about doing that? So it was a two-pronged approach to going about improving civility. And first one was to reach out to the community, to everybody here and everybody watching, to, uh, through either focus group surveys or wikis, and, uh, and get ideas, you know, solicit ideas and suggestions on how we could improve uh, civility. And so what we decided to do, we could do focus groups or surveys, we decided to go with a survey, and you probably saw the survey back in December of last year, okay, with six questions that we asked people to answer. And then we took that information, we collated, and you're going to hear some of that a little later. The other thing is we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. If other universities had, had already been through this and had some good ideas, we wanted to see if we could reach out and get that information and then see if we could incorporate any of that information here at NJCU. So that was, that was uh, the second part of it. Here's the overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to define what, how we went about doing this. Uh, we'll do an analysis of the Great College Survey, what our definition of civility is, uh, community outreach, and that was our questionnaire. Um, we actually flipped the last two. We're going to do recommendations first uh, because we think that's really important. And we'll do best practices after that if, there's, if time permits. So what was the approach? So we met back in September of last year, and we, the committee did, and we started to have an extensive discussion about the nature of civility and anecdotal um, uh, issues that might have come up with civility. And so we said, well, how are we going to go about identifying the problem? So what we did is we took the 2018 survey, and we, we ranked or we sorted it by percent positive response, 
and we said anything below 50% positive response is a potential problem area. And we looked at those statements or those questions, and we said, okay, which, which of those relate to civility? And so we, picked, so we picked six what we call red flag statements, and you're going to hear about those in a minute. We then went back to the 2013 survey, and we said, okay, how did these questions, what was the trend line? Were things getting better? Were things getting worse between, you know, over that five-year period? Uh, we also looked at the uh, 2017 survey to see what information we might be able to glean from that as well. And once we got that data, of course, we put together the survey to get the information back from people here, and we then come up with some suggestions. So that's the approach we took to uh, defining the problem and addressing the problem. And I'm now going to hand the floor over to Lucas, who is going to tell us a little bit about the Great Colleges Survey. Thank you, Robert. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <laughs> my name is Lucas Hallecom. I'm. Uh, you may or may not have seen me before. I'm over at the School of Business, so I don't spend as much time over here as I, I'd like. Um, but nevertheless, um, I'll be introducing sort of this part of our, our work here, specifically sort of as Rob has mentioned in terms of our approach, sort of actually before starting over and thinking about what, what we can do to improve, we wanted to make sure we know what the problem is. And um, so specifically, since that was also the um, sort of origin for the charge, um, we went back to our great colleges survey um, and looked at the statements that we felt were reflective of civility issues in general and then identified those where, um, as we said, red flags would emerge based on the responses that we saw. Okay? And so um, starting off, I, I just want to present sort of a list here. This is not um, ordered in any fashion, but essentially these are those statements where we said those are going to be most relevant and at the same time where um, NJCU appears to have um, a bit of an issue. Okay? So we can see that um, there is, seems to be a lack of being on the same team at this institution. The second statement was the extent to which senior leadership is able to communicate openly about important matters. Um, we see uh, senior leadership providing clear direction for the institution's future was one statement. Uh, changes being discussed in advance. So a lot of this already giving us certain themes that are, seem to be important. And then lastly, um, the last two, um, being able to count on people um, across departments as well as working well with people within the department. So those were sort of some questions where we felt that seems to be going at the heart of what we consider civility. And at the same time, this is certainly worrisome if a majority of um, respondents considers this to be, you know, disagreeable. So um, we'll go uh, a little bit into detail here based on those six statements. And the first thing we actually did was, well, we have two years, two data points, right? And um, so the first thing we wanted to do is look at the trends, okay? And as you can see here, um, and I've sort of abbreviated our six statements here, right? But the order is the same. And we basically simply looked at how did the response from the community change um, in 2013 compared to the more recent 2018 responses. And for better or for worse, we see a fairly unfortunate trend here, pretty much across all of those statements, in that um, the trend has worsened compared, comparing the sort of the earlier with the more current survey. Okay, of course, for some of them, that's um, Fairly, fairly extreme, right? If we just look at the very first statement, we weren't particularly um, well off to begin with, with a 45% agreement percentage, but this um, obviously dec decreased, fur decreased further by um, quite a bit. And even though, for example, here the last statement, if we're looking at cooperation within departments, so we seem to be doing better there, and there was not much of a, of a decrease as for some of the others, but um, nonetheless, this is the people that we all work with day to day, right? So even there, having less than two-thirds of the respondents sort of agree that this is the case, we would still consider this um, worrisome. And um, by the way, the, the sort of the red line that you see here is, is essentially our benchmark, right? And as, as per the, the survey, um, this was also considered sort of the, the trend line in terms of what, what considers poor performance, okay? So um, unfortunately, especially for the most recent results, we are at or below that reference point for virtually all of these statements. Okay, and that basically then um, reassured us in that this seems to be an issue 
and this is something that we um, want to consider spending our time on in terms of hopefully suggesting some solutions. Okay, in addition to this sort of time trend, we also had data on the different groups of respondents that we at least briefly wanted to look at. And so here you see the overall trend, which you see in the, in the black line here, um, broken down by respondent group. Um, there's also certain trends there where it seems that sort of faculty overall seem to be least um, satisfied um, in terms of most of these statements, whereas you know, some of our professional staff and management teams are uh, slightly more satisfied. But we also have to keep in mind the composition of the respondent base where faculty also only made up a min minority of the respondents. So that's, uh, that's a caveat to keep in mind here. Okay? So nonetheless, um, this gave us some ideas and also then informed our follow-up work, our follow-up survey that we will hear more about later in terms of us um, aiming to enlighten this a little bit more. Right? At the end of the day, this is sort of quantitative in nature. Right? We had those statements and we had people agree or disagree, but this doesn't really give us a lot of sort of Real, the, sort of the real stories behind those numbers, okay? And that was part of the aim that we'll be further talking about in a moment. Lastly, um, in addition to then breaking it down by, by respondent type, we also briefly looked at the data that we were provided in terms of comparing ourselves actually to our peers, okay? So not just looking at NJCU and compare to some, some benchmark that may or may not consider good or poor performance, but we also specifically wanted to look at how are other institutions doing that we would consider um, comparable to ourselves. And um, again, based on um, the, the survey data that we had there, we had um, groups that were considered the honor roll, so those would be sort of the top performers on various categories, okay? So that might be, if you will, the, the gold standard or the, the high achieving benchmark, as we can also see from the results here. And then we had the uh, Carnegie Ma Master's list, which is sort of more regional here, as well as our defined list of NJCU peers. Um, that should be those institutions sort of most comparable to us in terms of, you know, composition of the student body and, and location and so forth, okay? So in that sense, we were able to take away different things there, right? Clearly, we are um, in line with the trend that we saw earlier, certainly behind the, the top performers, but at the same time, we're also clearly behind what we would consider our peers. Okay, so it's not that we can just say, okay, we're just in a certain situation that is not comparable to some of the, the circumstances that other schools deal with, but even accounting for that, we're still um, seeing sort of room for improvement, certainly. Okay, and so that basically um, informed our work and um, then strengthened us in terms of our commitment to um, offer solutions here. All right, and based on that, and also before we go any further, we actually briefly wanted to talk about, when we talk about civility, what is that? And it's, it's a term that I'm sure everybody is familiar with, but at the end of the day, it also is a term that probably means a million things to a million different people. And so we wanted to make sure that we're sort of, as a committee, on the same page in terms of um, our understanding of this and what we're actually looking for. And so, um, based on a lot of the earlier discussions that Robert mentioned, um, we came up with this sort of general definition of civility for our work. And so we acknowledge that civility can certainly take many forms, um, and that is something that we're sort of intuitively familiar with, and obviously also has a lot of terms associated with it that we would consider maybe synonyms or at least aspects of it, including things like fairness, kindness, compassion, and goodwill. Um, but it doesn't only involve sort of our personal behavior, right? It's also a mindset, and of course, for us, more importantly, it's also an institutional um, feature, right? And of course, that's something that, given the situation that we find ourselves in, that is probably even more important. And so, what we say is that when civility is actively encouraged um, within an organization such as NJCU, or any place of work for that matter, um, we think that it should facilitate effective communication, and that's something that was largely reflected in a lot of those statements as well. Um, it should help to create shared objectives and ensure fair treatment, and therefore also enable collaboration and encourage leadership by essentially every individual in, within that organization. Okay, and so within that sort of broad framework, this broad concept, we will now continue our, 
our work and, and discuss our, our, what we actually did as a, as a task force other than just looking at, at the data we already have. So I'm happy to give, give this over to my colleague Mary, who will introduce us to the community outreach that we did and our results from that. When, when Rob said we were going to be tag teaming, I didn't think he meant that you had to be graceful with that. So anyway, my name is Mary Mitgriff. And um, part of what we did was to, in addition to considering information from the Great Colleges Survey, we also sent out a survey that, 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 that you hopefully remember receiving and hopefully remember completing. Um, because the Great Colleges Survey was helpful in terms of giving us numeric data. It was largely quantitative, lots of percentage responses. But it, what it didn't do in terms of enabling us to, to meet our charge was provide us with a nicely localized um, uh, type of response that would give us examples, give us context to be able to understand really what was behind those numbers in the Great Colleges Survey. So we essentially decided to, for that element of it, to get these kinds of qualitative um, scenarios, we decided to try to send out our own just to further clarify and better understand what was around the concern with civility at NJCU. So what we did was we did send out a survey. You can see here that we, we received 238 responses. This wasn't the kind of survey that you had to answer every question in order to submit. So 238 responses represents the number of folks that did complete the survey overall. Um, and within the survey, we essentially had six questions that we wanted to know about. We were interested um, in whether folks considered NJCU a civil place to work. We wanted to understand different views about how respondents would view civility or characterize that. Importantly, we asked for examples of what people would consider civil behavior and then uncivil behavior. And we wanted to know um, what folks' thoughts were around why having a civil campus is important and what people's vision of a civil campus would involve. So I'd like to share these responses, keeping in mind that that total number of responses doesn't equate to that number of responses overall. So first of all, you can see here to the question regarding um, whether folks would agree or disagree with the, with the statement that um, NJCU faculty and staff members are civil to one another, the majority responded in agreement to that statement. Very small amount w w was conditional, and a near 20% responded that they would disagree with that statement. When asking for responses about how people view civility, you can see by the size of the words on this graphic the frequency of responses. So polite and respect jump out largely. Um, but if we take a look at this um, just in terms of a bar graph of responses, you can see here, here again, respect, respectful, anything with that root word, respect, um, came up the most in terms of how people view civility. That was followed by polite and or politeness. And you can see it conti the continuum goes down along those lines toward helpful, which was our least frequent response in people's vision of civility in NJCU. We wanted to know how people would view civil behavior. These are things that they'd experienced as civil behavior or, or seen or witnessed in terms of others' interactions. And what we did here was we basically took our responses and categorized them. And what you see here is a frequency of, of response by category. So that 40.6% of people that responded gave us scenarios and examples that all related back to um, collegial uh, relationships, that working with, uh, that they were able to work with folks in a, in a manner in which people supported one another in doing their jobs. The next category of responses had to do with open-mindedness or being open to um, perspectives or viewpoints that differed from their own and being receptive to, to a variety of responses or a variety of viewpoints. Next, acts of kindness. Saying thank you, holding the elevator, 
Um, these kinds of things were, were among those responses. And then the last category had to do with effective communication, so that people got information that they considered relevant to their work um, in a timely manner. So again, this is, these are examples of civil behavior at NJCU and in the frequency in which they, 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 uh, we received them in our responses. So the next one has to do is the reverse, right? So uncivil behavior. And the most frequent type of response we got were curt answers, sharply worded responses, um, things that could be kind of grouped under the heading of, of rudeness. Following that was unresponsiveness. So we kind of look at this as the, the opposite of communication, right? So sending emails and either not getting a response back or getting a response back in a time frame that's not helpful. And then the last category pretty much had to do with subordinate supervisor, or organizationally subordinate and supervisor relationships so that people that were Sub were, I'm stressing the word organizationally subordinate, um, felt that maybe if they had a viewpoint or a concern that that, wasn't, that was received in a dismissive way by folks in an empowered position. So that was the last sort of response that we got in people characterizing uncivil behavior at NJCU. So we wanted to know, um, you know, in your, what would it take or what, would, what do you think in terms of creating a civil, uh, civil campus and why does this matter? And largely these responses all hit on the idea of it enables people to do their job better so that the most frequent one had to do with being able to produce good results, being able to be productive in your position. Next, the quality of life, that it makes for a quality of life that's pleasant and productive. The third category, civility is, is exhausting, was closely followed by an interesting category, isn't it obvious? In other words, why does this need to even be on the survey? Um, so these were things, and then lastly, the last question was, uh, we wanted people to tell us, for them, the main ideas that come to mind when thinking about civility, and the best way to represent this is for you all to see the key words that fall underneath these categories. The categories being communication, and you can see following that discussion, consultation, listening, and transparency. And then across, and then, and across each row, you can see words that people uh, linked to respect, to collaboration, and then lastly, stressing the idea of being generally polite to one another. So this was the gist of, of our survey. And what we did basically was use this, this qualitative information, and combined this with the information that was more numeric from the uh, Great Colleges survey. And we're going to share some recommendations. Wow, Mary's a very good speaker. <laughs> I'm not. Um, uh, good afternoon, I'm Vanessa Garcia. I'm with the Criminal Justice Department, um, and I am going to discuss the recommendations. Um, just to um, put it out there, the recommendations were a mixture of the uh, uh, analyzing the best colleges survey that was discussed in detail um, prior. Uh, a lot of what came out within the survey um, a lot of the best practices that uh, the group analyzed that will be uh, discussed after the recommendations, as well as uh, the actual um, uh, task force itself. So it, it, these recommendations were in pulled, out, pulled out of thin air. Um, so recommendation one, um, we recommend that uh, we demonstrate a civil campus as an institutional value, okay? So in this, what we're recommending is that all the stakeholders get together to create a definition of civility. And we have a little cheat sheet that gives some details um, that uh, Ellen Quinn had passed around. And so when we're looking at the definition of civility, it should be in line with the mission statement for NJCU. Um, it should also be in line with the values of the university. And if some of these values are not up to par for, uh, to some people's thinking, then that's something that civility initiatives need to work on. Um, but we also recommended that we develop a civility mission or vision for the university. So separate from the, univer uh, the university's mission statement, there should be a civility statement. Um, so this is extremely important. Uh, recommendation two, create an organizational structure for support of a civility initiative. So 
in all of our recommendations, we understand how is this going to be done. We are recommending that a, civil, a civility champion be, um, uh, or a liaison, if you will, be assigned. Uh, we're thinking probably from HR that, that kind of just made the most sense for us, but obviously we don't make these decisions, these are just recommendations. Um, and so when we're looking at uh, the liaison, uh, the liaison is going to be looking at issues of um, diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, um, dealing with, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, uh, specific in, uh, in situations of incivility to be able to make, possibly mediate. But we also uh, recommend a civility committee that's going to work with the liaison, with the civility champion. Um, and the civility committee um, will help with various initiatives, including dealing with actual um, incidents of incivility. We also recommend a role for uh, students in civility review. Um, the best colleges uh, survey did not include students. It was an employee survey. And the task force and the university at large, we are very student oriented and we understand the need to ensure that students are involved, that students are involved in our civility initiatives, but also are being held to a level of civility that is within the values of NJCU. So um, we are recommending that a student be involved, not in handling employee on employee civility issues, but student civility issues, because we understand the delicacy of employee uh, work issues. Um, so the student would be um, uh, involved in initiatives of civility around campus, but also um, complaints of civility related to students in the classroom, dorms, campus, clubs, and, and on teams. Um, so we thought this was very important. Number three, enhancing communication. Uh, this was a huge issue in the best uh, colleges survey as well as the, um, uh, the survey that the civility, the online survey civility uh, task force did. And that was a, a Qualtrics survey. If you recall, if, if you um, did not um, uh, participate in the survey, the survey did mention that we set it up so that no uh, tracing of the people participating could be involved. Uh, this way, people felt comfortable that it was a safe environment. Um, so in enhancing communication, uh, we recommend that there would, that rules of civility are placed in, in public and open and uh, communicated. So we were uh, proposing a website, possibly a handbook, but uh, you know, things are very electronic these days. We don't want to use the money for paper, but you know, we sh we've seen a lot of, of institutions create civility websites, and this is a place where we can have our initiatives, we can have our mission, civility mission statement, um, the initiatives. Um, we recommend uh, providing administrative code of ethics uh, to the public, uh, the NJCU public, as well as rules of professional behavior at NJCU um, and, and possibly list those um, you know, issues of civility within the employee contract. Um, and then address the need to uh, clearly uh, provide clearly written uh, procedures and grievance policies. Uh, this was something that a lot of people were you know, unclear of uh, what the procedures were or, or the uh, criticism that there were procedures but the procedures were unenforced. And so this is something that um, if they are not being enforced presently, that we need a new structure that will enforce these procedures so that those being treated in an uncivil manner have a, um, a voice. We don't want to silence anybody. Uh, the, uh, recommendation number four, educate and support. Educate the campus community on conflict resolution. I believe the School of Business has a huge uh, thing in this, right? So um, I imagine they want to be um, involved in something of this nature. So, as well as the importance of a civil, a civil um, con, uh, excuse me, campus. Support initiatives on campus that encourage civility. Um, recognize those who initiate events uh, to address issues of, of civility. And then provide training, management training, uh, conflict management training. So these things are extremely important uh, to help increase the campus environment of civility. And then finally, monitoring the situation. Monitor, monitor, monitor. I mean, we're going through the middle states now. You know, we need to constantly monitor. Um, so this is something that um, the uh, civility champion and the committee can, um, whoever will be sit sitting on this committee, can uh, monitor the initiatives, can monitor our red flags. Um, you know, we can, we recommend putting a rating for civility in the performance appraisals and evaluations. 
um, and then also providing annual progress reports to the NJCU community, which I guess could also be on the website. So these are uh, some of our recommendations. Um, and uh, now we're going to discuss best practices. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to finish up. Um, so y you would think, or we thought, that there'd be plenty of information out there uh, from other universities on civility. And, and surprisingly, there wasn't as much as, as you might think. Most of it, the information we could find had to do with students to student civility or students, you know, a, a civil environment if you happen to bring somebody onto campus who has ideas or opinions different from your own. There wasn't so much out there that had to deal with, um, you, you know, faculty to faculty, administration to faculty, et cetera, that type of civility. But there was some information, and we found that some information from TCNJ, Ocean County College, the University of Missouri, and the University of Maryland at Baltimore. And I think one of the things we found is they do take a holistic approach to civility in their environment. And many of, our, um, many of our recommendations actually parallel some of the things we found with these universities. So first of all, there's an institutional response. And really, it, I think when you look at this, it's, it's the, uh, the management sets the, the, the mood for the organization, right? And so they have within their, their, um, their value statements or their mission statements, they deal with civility. So for example, uh, TCNJ, the president there, identified civility as a special responsibility within their long-range plans, and they incorporated it into their values. Um, at Ocean County College, the institutional commitment to civility was modeled by those in leadership positions, and they created a campus civility contact in HR, and as you noticed, some of those things were incorporated in ours. Um, University of Missouri and University of Maryland, they both list civility as core values. So at an institutional level, they're saying, you know what, this is something that we're really, we, we value, this is important to us. Then campus-wide, so we're kind of going from the top down here, so then campus-wide, the community articulates the value of civility and respect for an institution of education with a diverse workforce and student population. And so, for example, uh, the University of Maryland, they had a web initiative where you could take a pledge and choose civility that you would act in a civil manner. And they also instituted uh, two promotions there. So they had a core value award to award civility. And they also had a core value speaker series where they discussed civility. And finally, we, we're going, again, from institution to campus to individual. Through an organized effort of education and dialogue, members of the campus community identify behavior that encourages respect and creates shared activities for valuing civility. And so, for example, at the University of Missouri, they had workshops on conflict resolution and bullying, which all involve civility. At TCNJ, they also had conflict resolution workshops. And at University of Missouri, they had flyers on um, social interactions, how to improve, improve social interactions. And they also had a very, it's kind of an interesting initiative. They had something called a yellow button initiative. So they handed out yellow buttons. And if somebody held the elevator for you, for example, you would give them the yellow button and then on a website, you would, you would basically put them down as like this person acted in a civil manner. It was kind of like pay it forward. Then they would take the yellow button, and if somebody treated them in a civil manner, they'd give them the yellow button, and it moved around the campus in that manner. So that was, that was the way individuals could be thinking on a regular basis about how do I treat people in a civil manner. So those were the, that was the information we got gathered from outside of our own organization as far as civility is concerned. And so that, that pretty much finishes. There's our task force again. And um, any additional comments from the committee? Anybody want to say anything more, fill in any gaps? Or I guess we'd be happy to answer any questions. Stunned silence. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you for your attention. So my question is, on the slide that showed the faculty, um, CWA, and managers, there wasn't a representation for uh, AFT professional staff, so I was just wondering if they were accounted for in that. No, I believe it was AFT. I mean, that's, that was the faculty response, right? That's a, yeah. yeah, that's the faculty response. So, so we had, because this is the data that we had, we followed the same structure there. I would imagine that, um, depending on designation, AFT would then be part of either the manager or the faculty group, um, depending on the individual respondent. 
But so this was the, this is the sort of the, the respondent groups that we had to work with. So that's what we followed here. Yes. Again, I think um, we, we worked with the data that was in the survey, uh, how they decided in 2018 to 2013 which groups would be surveyed. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, oh, Sue has an answer. So everyone did participate, had the option to participate in the survey, the whole campus, all staff. The reason that these individuals and task forces didn't get for AFT professional staff or AFT is because the response rate was so low that the, the great colleges folks didn't give it to us. If it's, if it's below a certain number, they don't want anyone to inadvertently out themselves as an individual response. But okay, thank so we you. are included in the whole problem. All right, thanks, Sue. Sorry. That's okay. You have the answer. Yes. Well, points well taken. I mean, we, we discussed this, and we, one of our suggestions was to have, a, a, for example, in performance appraisals, uh, a metric for civility. And, you know, there's the old saying, and I'm paraphrasing, what gets measured gets done. So if it's put in there as a metric, then chances are it's going to get done. And so, I, but the, the issue with that is I'm not quite sure, you know, how do we work that into faculty interactions and things like that? I mean, you might include civility in tenure appraisals and, and promotion appraisals. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you might address that. Yeah. Yes? I think I heard that um, faculty, at least the input faculty, was a smaller number than the rest of the respondents. Can I get an idea of what that was and, and whether they would, I mean, you don't have to give me any specifics. I'm just wondering uh, if there was any I mean, our, our survey didn't break it down by, by faculty or staff. No, the, we were talking the Great Colleges survey. Oh, yeah, yeah, so that one, yeah. Yeah, so, so they, they that, that was the respondent issue. We, our own uh, outreach didn't uh, differentiate by, by those groups. Um, frankly, I'm, I'm not entirely sure when the Great Colleges surveys were conducted each year. So I, I yeah, so we, we only had that data, so I wouldn't be able to, to speak to, to that. We had discussions about that, what those numbers might mean in terms of um, is it low for, for reasons like you mentioned in terms of administratively or is it a response in itself, right, that folks weren't willing to or felt uncomfortable responding? Um, that's something the committee talked about, but yeah, at the end of the day, we, we didn't feel that we could um, necessarily speak to that. Yes. Um, I didn't notice um, honesty or truthfulness in any of these slides. Are they somehow incorporated within any of these dimensions and in your work? Honesty and truthfulness. I mean, I would, I would jump maybe over here a little bit. So essentially what we did was, was um, and I'm, I'm speaking for Mary here in part, but essentially work with the, the open-ended responses that we were obviously given and then simply essentially, at least for this particular question, conduct sort of counts in terms of what was being mentioned. Um, I, would, I would interpret it in a way that, of course, honesty plays a big role into, in many of those dimensions here in terms of respect and being polite and, and courtesy and so forth. 
but um, yeah, it, it wasn't mentioned enough to, to show up here individually. But are you, are you referring to the Great Colleges survey or our survey, or, or both? So my question is to refer to the overall presentations. Uh, I'm familiar with those initial surveys, uh, but I wanted to know more about your committee's work and whether that came up and what your findings were and more significantly what your recommendations would be in regard to honesty and truthfulness. It, it, I don't believe it, I'm speaking for the committee here, but I don't believe it explicitly came up as honesty as, as one of the things we considered. But as Lucas said, I think it's just implied in treating people with respect. And we did have transparency and open communication. So it is, again, if, you know, hopefully if you're transparent and you're communicating, you're telling the truth. I hope. <laughs> oh, We're just okay. set, told to. Thank you. Um, just two suggestions to operationalize this going forward. Uh, we're working on a strategic plan right now. It's in its infancy. And also at the Senate, um, a plan was put forth to uh, work on a faculty handbook. So I think a section on civility uh, coalescing what you've got here might be a good idea. Sure. For the sake of civility. Yeah. Thank you. Can you go to the other slide that kind of had those uh, seven or eight things up there? <clears throat> No, not that one. The one that I talked oh, about. The one from the great colleges. Right, right, right. So I, so I guess this is more a comment than a question. But I think that we're getting mixed up this slide with the civility issue. First of all, I've been here for 30 plus years, and this is a very civil campus. I think every time I've interacted, whether it's faculty or staff or students, mo almost all of the interactions have been positive, respectful, caring, etc. Yeah, do you catch somebody on a bad day and someone's acting like a jerk? Yeah, but that happens in life, right? So that's one thing. But I think these are the ones that I think for some reason this conversation at the end kind of focused on the issue of civility with all these recommendations, which I think are great and things that maybe the institution consider. But I think this is really the most important part of, this, of the, what the discussion be focused on. And I think this really speaks uh, to the relationship between work, workers and the leadership. Because I think uh, when you talked about earlier about civility being established by leadership, et cetera, yeah, that, that's, I would agree. But sense of belonging and being on the same team comes from the top on down and how you bring people together. The issues of open communication, transparency, et cetera, all comes from how we, we receive information from the top. And I think these are more indicative of, um, and I don't want to uh, use any kind of alarming words because I think the slides speak for themselves, but I think this is really where the focus of the conversation and the recommendation should be, less on trying to send us all to civility classes and how do we should be more respectful or giving me a button. And again, no diss on the people that put that up. But, but uh, and I think, at, number one, all the faculty people that put this together, you've done an excellent job in presenting the data, presenting the information. But I just think that this is where, uh, it says red flags for a reason. So, anyway. Well, I, two things. I think if, if you look at the Great Colleges survey, the statements, there's nothing in there that explicitly says, deals with civility. It all kinds of dances around the issues like communication and respect and things like that. And the second thing is, I, I think I would agree with you because when we did our survey, if you look at the, the first question, almost 50% of the people agreed that, yes, we're a civil campus or sometimes somewhat, and only 20% approximately disagreed. So it was almost two and a half times agreed that this, in fact, is a you know, fairly relatively civil campus. So there was another. Yes, uh, I have a two-pronged question. First, um, when you showed the ideas from other campuses, mm -hmm. um, it seemed that they mostly tried to notice and applaud examples of civility. Um, did they also take the approach that your committee did of saying that you wanted to, they wanted to establish a grievance process to monitor people who they consider not civil, a policing, if you will. Um, and if, whether they did or not, d did you think on the committee as to whether being monitored and told that you were grieved for lack of civility, will that make the person more civil in the future? I, I don't think we wanted to become a police state for civility. <laughs> right? That really wasn't what we were aiming for, and we did have a discussion. I mean, a lot of these things are really in the, the purview of HR and, and you know, interpersonal relationships. There, We can't get involved with that. Um, Ellen, maybe you can speak better. I, I don't think that showed up at all. Yeah. 
I, I just think, was this something that were, oh, oops. Um, I think the shorter answer is no. With the question was, did other universities have some kind of a grievance committee, right, where people would kind of police if there was some, an individual who was a problem? Give it back to me. Yes. They have um, they had a vice president position to handle uh, civility questions uh, and diversity uh, issues. So they combined the two. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much, folks. We appreciate your attention. One more oh, question. I thought we had to. All right, um, one more question. I'm Bill Kalathis, and I often like to be the last question. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for arranging that for me. Um, certainly, I want to applaud the committee's work in doing um, what seems to be a, a wonderful job. And I certainly, um, I guess, have a couple of questions. One, whether the committee will exist uh, moving onward, but hold off. Let me ask the other questions. And like John, I've been here over 30 years as well. And um, you know, I can see some methodological problems with the way the survey was conducted, some issues around the questions and the definitions. I can question reliability and validity issues statistically. I'm not going to go into that. But I, I hope that the qualitative aspect of it continues on, because as a union president for six years, as a grievance chair, um, certainly in an asymmetrical organization where administration maintains so much authority legally and through some limitations of contract, um, and the union is very uh, cognizant of lots of issues of uncivil behavior due to the asymmetrical nature of the relationship. So uh, I would only hope that the committee would reach out to the unions on campus to begin to talk about things, because we do have a grievance committee, and we do actually work very hard to make sure that whatever um, injustices may or may not occur as a result of those asymmetries are addressed in an adequate moral and ethical manner. Thank you. Nancy brought this up on a regular basis in our committee. Okay, yeah, so we were aware uh, of that. Still yes. continue the work because yeah. there are many well, things that's... that you don't know about. <laughs> that was one of the recommendations. Yes. All right, thanks, Max. Sorry, I'll keep this very brief. I know we want to move on to the next presentation. This I might actually at the bit here. They want this, to... this might actually cross over between the two presentations because this is my tenth year here at NJCU. I honestly don't think we have a civility problem, as John was pointing out. I think the real issue is one of transparency and communication. And I'm going to ask this, and I know nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room here, but my 10 years here, nobody talks transparently about budget issues. That creates a lot of rumors, a lot of dissension, a lot of difficulty. And until there's clear and honest communication and transparency regarding budgetary issues, I, I don't think it's going to be possible for people to feel like they are, they are being respected. So it's not a civility problem, it's a communication problem, and I think it comes down, ultimately the budget is one of the main issues that needs to be transparently communicated across faculty, staff, and everybody here. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you for that. All right, again, thank you very much, folks. Hi there, good afternoon. Okay, good. We're working. Hi there, my name is Gail Marquis, and I'm one of the co chairs for the Task Force for Shared Governance. Um, my other co chair is Ann Mabry, and I'm going to ask our whole, our whole uh, task force to please stand up, turn, and wave to the crowd. <laughs> so that you know who participated in this. Thank you. I told you I was going to call you out. 
All righty. No, I don't want to read the names, but the names are there. You know who they are. Uh, you should have conversations with them in the dining room or around campus and all. That's what I want you to, to know who they were. Uh, again, my name is Gail Marquis. I'm in development. I'm the Director of Development for Arts and Sciences. And we were charged on the Shared Governance Committee to, uh, to look at shared governance, first of all, to define it. What is, what is meant by shared governance? What strategies would enhance shared governance at the university? Uh, secondly, how? How do you engage your campus community? We did focus group surveys, wikis. Uh, the task force is a, con is a conduit of the larger community, so final recommendations reflect those overall thoughts. Uh, also, how in review has this uh, been successful at other universities? So again, as the civility group has mentioned, we also took a look at great colleges to see how great colleges did things. We look at colleges in uh, New Jersey, in our, our area. We looked at colleges that with the same size as NJCU, enrollment, faculty size, staff size. So we were trying to get the same numbers. And finally, at the end of it all, we were charged with putting a presentation together, which is what we have here, summarizing our work, uh, uh, referencing where we, we got the information from, and then, of course, finally, the recommendations. So the first thing we, we, we worked over, and I really, I should preface this after you saw our committee, is that we met probably, I think, since October. Every month, twice a month, similar to civility, uh, we had meetings, we had agendas, we took meeting minutes. We always had a quorum, except for maybe one time. Uh, you met the members here, everyone was very diligent. Nobody sat on the sidelines and expected somebody else to do the work. We had very heated conversations, our emails were always buzzing, so there were plenty of people that were involved. Uh, also, a lot of our information was shared within our committee, our task force, via email, via Blackboard, uh, and it all added to the robust conversations that we had. I guess to start, some of the content and for shared governance that we, we had came from the American Association of the University of, of Professors. And they wrote in 1915, it's not up there, that the variety and the complexity of the tasks performed by institutions of higher education produce an in, uh, inescapable escapable interdependence among governing boards, administrations, faculty, students, and others. And the relationship calls for adequate communications among these components and full opportunity for appropriate joint planning. So coming off of that, we were charged with just with getting a definition. And I think we labored over the definition for months, much longer than we, would th we thought. But we wanted to get it right. We wanted to uncover. We wanted to look at different entities that also had shared governance. And we came down to this one, simply put, so you could remember, shared governance is a collaborative approach to major decision making. From there, we did expand on it, expanded on the definition as it is a commitment to a set of principles through which faculty, staff, students, alumni, administrators, and we even included the board of trustees participate in the important decisions regarding the operations of the university. Stakeholders, there are many, acknowledge that many decisions affect some constituents more than others, but still, shared governance functions through a structure that fosters active collaboration, transparency, accountability, acceptance of compromise, mutual respect, and an ethos of trust. And one thing when we were putting this presentation together, uh, we, it, it's a long one, I'm not gonna read each and every slide, but we knew it was a documentation. I've been on, on uh, GothicNet, I've been on, on different Google, different platforms, and I still see items, strategic plans, uh, written documentations going 10 years back. So we wanted to make sure we put everything that we had into this document, including the participants, our task force. And if you see at the, at the bottom, the footer, it will stay on each slide. Simply, simply put, shared governance is a collaborative approach to a major decision making. At the end of this presentation, we also turned it over to our four champions. You met, the, met them at the beginning. In addition to the presentation, they have an appendix of all of the questions, the survey questions that we did, the answers, and the breakdowns. They also have a list of all of our references. So again, 
10 years from now or two years from now, if they want to go back and look at this, they will have the documentation right there for them. Some of the principles, the principles in and around the shared governance definition, effective shared governance recognizes that there are varying levels of responsibility in decision making. Uh, however, this does not preclude the inclusion of constituents most affected by decisions in the process. So even though we do have shared governance, it can also mean that there is, it affects, it's naturally going to affect different areas, you're going to get more input around an affected decision. Also, it's based on the pragmatic belief that better decisions are made when multiple perspectives are considered. And we continue to take this into account as we were, one, putting our de definition together, putting our recommendations together. Uh, the initial slide showing where all of our task members came from, we tried, we were selected or we were selected for the committee. We volunteered to be in the overall task force and then we were, we were placed in different committees. Uh, so, so again, they were looking to make it a little more broad based and hopefully cover more, more areas. So it wasn't just from uh, professors or just from faculty. We tried to, we were placed in such to cover more areas. Again, expanding on the definition of shared governance, it demands work and accountability beyond the voicing, voicing of opinions. And it's a function of cultural shared governance requires work, trust, empathy, civility again comes into play, patience, and honesty. And we saw these virtues as not expedient or convenient, but their absence can have uh, deleterious and even toxic effects on the university climate. Principle number four, also leading back to shared governance, that it must be integrated into the formal structures and processes of the university, such as the formation and the implementation of the strategic plan, the budget, and introduction of new technology. And principle number five, again in shared governance, it links the structural divisions of the institution so that we are not operating in silos, we are operating together. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and co-chair, co Anne, to take us forward on the expectations. Okay. Thanks, Gail. Okay. So we're still on the first charge. We've, we did the short definition. There's only one thing you remember. Is everybody hearing me? Okay. Now it's okay? Um, so I'm still on the first charge. Gail just did the short definition and then the longer definition. Then she did the principles under which um, shared governance can operate. If there's only one thing you remember today. It's going to be that simply put statement. That's like our elevator pitch. If, you know, before coming into this, we ourselves didn't really have a clear concept of shared governance. And this is what it is. So um, please memorize this because this is, this is it, um, if there's nothing else. So expectations is part of the charge number one. And we called them expectations um, rather than recommendations. Recommendations are going to come after our survey. Expectations are givens. They're not negotiable. Um, so the first one is that we expect a commitment from the administration to those principles that Gail just outlined. Um, we expect the Board of Trustees to meet at least, at least six times a year. Right now they're meeting twice, um, uh, excluding the emergency four, excluding the emergency meetings. Okay. We also have faculty expectations. We expect the Senate committees to meet regularly. We expect the faculty to participate fully in committee work. Next. Um, we also would like to have the Board of Trustees come to campus on a more informal basis. Why not have them come for luncheons, a, a, a brown bag lunch once a month, or listening sessions, or just walkthroughs on campus? Um, we need more ro robust interactions between faculty and staff and the Board of Trustees. Um, all of these are important, but we kept coming up, with this, what kept coming up over and over again was the strategic plan. It has to embody shared governance. So the strategic plan becomes the, 
uh, a part of the DNA of the university using share, shared governance in its creation and implementation. Finally, we expect our work to continue in some form. Um, it could be a, uh, some kind of formalized structure. So I'm going to, what happened to my, what happened to my part two? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So we too were charged with engaging the community. Um, first of all, we felt that our group itself was a representative group of the community. Um, we represent student affairs, university advancement, um, the three colleges, and the School of Business. We also invited Dr. Joshi to come meet with us um, to share with us her views of shared governance. We actually met from, for almost more than, well, almost two hours, more than two hours. And it was an incredible meeting. For some of us, it's the first time we've actually had a chance to have a face-to-face, -face, and it was it was, it was really great. We got a lot of insight from her. And then finally, we did a survey as well. Um, so the survey came from the AAUP. Um, it was distributed. There were 29 questions. It was focused specifically on evaluation of shared governance. It was distributed between January 23rd and February 7th. We sent it to all the constituents we could think of. I mean, all the faculty, staff, all the um, administrators, board of, oh, that's coming up, sorry. There were 162 respondents, and here is the sort of breakdown. The highest number of respondents were the faculty, 67 faculty responded, followed by uh, professional staff with 48. Next kind of tied was adjunct faculty with administrators. Given the fact that there's over 400 adjunct faculty, the 16 is, really makes that response rate negligible. Um, but, but there were 17 administrators, but there were zero board of trustees. Um, so we had 29 questions, and we have our complete survey results uh, at the end of our PowerPoint, which I, I believe is going to be distributed to the campus community by Jason Kroll or by Aaron Aska. So you all will have a chance to see these. We picked four questions. Um, and we chose the questions not where there were the biggest disparities between the yeses and the noes, but the ones that were relevant to three broad themes. The first one is trust. The second one was communication, which is the next slide, and then finally budget, getting to what Max was saying. So um, in terms of trust, are communications carried out in good faith and in an atmosphere of trust? Um, only around 20, 21% of the, of the respondents said yes. We looked at communication slash consultation. Question number eight was, um, does, the does consultation by the administration with faculty and staff allow time uh, for them to consult with their constituents before offering recommendations? Um, only a, a little less than 20% uh, percent responded yes to that question, that there's a, enough time and a mechanism for consultation. Um, do we have timely access to information? That's number nine necessary for us to have input into the governance processes. And again, um, all around 16% of the people said yes. Planning and budget, the, 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 next, uh, the next two. Um, question 17, does the institution recognize joint responsibility for decision making um, in long range planning? 20, around 23% said yes. And finally, in the area of budgeting, is there, does the institution recognize that there's joint responsibility for decision making in the area of budgeting? And f barely 16% said yes. Um, this, 
our survey uh, mirrors the great colleges to work for results, so there were no great surprises. However, I do want to talk about one category of I don't know. Um, there were actually a lot of people who said I don't know. I'm ranging anywhere from uh, 6%, which was only one question, um, to a high of 81% um, not knowing. But the majority of the I don't knows were around 20 to 30% of the respondents, which we thought was fairly high. And um, we're not sure why, but we believe it boils down to a communication problem where people uh, don't know because of a lack of information, a lack of shared information. Um, okay. John. We are moving on to best practices. You're going to. OK, good afternoon. OK, so our third charge was best practices. Um, all right, so we looked at the, the extent literature out there. Um, we went back pretty far, too. We realized that shared governance literature dates back, dates back hundreds of years. Um, interesting. Um, I'll save you that lit review. Um, then we looked the past 100 years, that's when it really starts to, um, you start to see the literature on universities and shared governance. However, the literature that we pulled from stems from the past 10 years. So we not only stem from the literature of the past 10 years, but we looked at some universities that are comparable to um, our, comparable to our university here. So, all right, so best practices, what works? So. 2018 great colleges recognized with comparable enrollment. Um, so there were two colleges that we looked at um, that these colleges came up in not only our meetings, but meetings with our chairs also. And that's the College of New Jersey and Stockton University. Um, so what I have below here are the themes that these two colleges share. Now I'll also note that these themes extend the literature that I will be talking about as well. So that's standing, shared governance, task force, and committees. Um, so Stockton and TCNJ have a task force that is ongoing. Um, shared governance of the strategic plan. That's some, one thing that we're going to recommend today as well. Um, unfettered contributions that contribute to a healthy community. Um, I feel like I'm overlapping now with the civility. So there, you're going to see overlaps between the two presentations here. All right, encourage buy-in of all stakeholders. Okay, again, this goes to civility. Um, create opportunities for processes and planning. Facilitate civility and communications. How about that? Um, so these were the themes that we found throughout the literature. Um, and we found in these two colleges here that we are comparing ourselves to in the great colleges to work for survey. All right, so. An exemplar of shared governance here is the Academic Senate of California Community Colleges, and I'll read this since we are taping, make recommendations with respect to academic and professional matters which are mutually agreed upon through written resolution and regulations, including programming, policies, development, reviews, involvement in accreditation, institutional planning, budget development, and other professional matters. All right, so one thing to note here with the Academic Senate of California Community Colleges this is law. This isn't just for one campus. This is law in California. So we thought that was significant. So um, another exemplar of shared governance is University of Louisville, Kentucky. All right, so again, I'll read this. In a system of shared governance, respect for the diversity of opinion is of the utmost importance. The Board of Trustees, administrators, faculty, staff, and students will not always be of one voice on matters of policy and practice, and dissent from the majority view must be respected by all involved. That last statement there is very powerful. Okay? I, I almost want to say, can we take a moment and reflect right here? <laughs> um, um, so, moving on. Okay, so. Some more review of literature. All right, so while there's a growing body of research to build upon the extant literature on shared governance, college and universities nationwide and globally continue to struggle with the how and why decisions are made. All right, I'll even, before I address the how and why, I'd like to say that throughout the literature, we learned that 
shared gov the definition of shared governance is not the same at every university. It's a definition that is tailored to each university. Therefore, we have to construct our own definition, which is something that we've done in the beginning. Um, now that we're all in the room here and the community is in the room, maybe we'll reconsider that definition even. This should be a living document that moves forward and helps us here. So let's address the how and why. How and why, we can look at that two ways. How and why, as far as reflecting back. All right, let's think about that. But why don't we look at that in a proactive way and think how and why before decisions are made. How can we make better decisions? And if we're going to make a decision, why are we making that decision before we set it in stone? So let's think about this not only after the fact and be reactive to it, but let's be proactive here. All right, um, another line here, and I'll read this. The breadth and scope of shared governance at NJCU must not only draw upon exemplar literature, but should be championed by the governing boards of the institution and facilitate meaningful communication and systematic collaboration among faculty, administrators, students, and board of trustees. Now, as I read this, I think, well, yeah, this makes sense. But can we all say that we've done this in the past? Now, we may have, but is it something that we really think about when we're making decisions in our own departments? It's very easy to go siloed here, I'll turn that into a verb. Um, but think about that. This is something that we should consider when we're making decisions moving forward. All right, another one. Uh, and this comes from the Association of Governing Boards, Universities, and Colleges white paper. When done well, shared governance strengthens the quality of leadership and decision making at an institution, enhances its ability to achieve its vision and to meet strategic goals, and increase the odds that the very best thinking by all parties to shared governance is brought to bear on institutional challenges. The word challenges, think about that. We have challenges that we're facing. Working together, we either can get through them. We can, of course, look back to see how we got to this point, but we can also look forward here to see how we can get through these challenges together. Okay, another what works. Differences in the weight of each voice from one point to the next should be determined by the reference to the responsibility of each component for the particular matter at hand. So in a shared governance body, there may be different weight in each governing board, which is related to the constituents that it affects. Okay, and then we'll move on to charge four here. But actually, before I do that, I'd like to say that Again, what we've noticed is shared governance, the def not only the definition varies in the literature review, but we've also noticed that, I mentioned the exemplars in the, in the beginning of the literature review, but we've also noticed that shared governance is not easy. Even the universities that I mentioned earlier struggle with it. Um, it's not something that you can really narrow down and point a finger on. Uh, and put your finger on and say, this is what needs to be done. That, that in itself, not, not being done by a body, is not shared governance. So universities are struggling with it. They continue to struggle with it. But I wonder if, as a result of the foundation that I believe we're laying today, if we can consider moving forward and considering shared governance for NJCU, drawing upon this literature, and becoming an exemplar for shared governance. So on that note, I will hand it back to Ann. We have three recommendations. Okay. First of all, all of us have to work collaboratively to develop a climate of trust. That's first and foremost. If we don't have trust, then we're not going to have shared governance. So. We have to have, so that's nicely said, but we need a structure of participation for how that would happen. Um, so to continue with this, I'm going to talk about the structure of participation on the next slide, but I want to continue with this climate of trust. This encompasses long-term planning, budget, and other key decisions. And it can't just be 
direct communication and mere consultation, that's, we have to have that, but it's going to go beyond that. That's not going to be enough. So um, continuation with recommendation one, developing a structure of participation um, includes adherence to the board approved Senate constitution. We actually have a document that, that will give us a structure for participation and that's our Senate, that's our board approved Senate constitution. Um, there should be another bullet, but right after this. We also need to increase opportunities for interaction between all of us, staff, faculty, administrators, and board of trustees, beyond just these search committees that seem to be the only time that there is all this uh, interaction among different constituents. So for example, the board of trustees actually has board committees. I believe, what, there's four, four of them? That would be an opportunity for faculty to um, increase interaction with the board of trustees. Recommendation number two is that it must be a core value in the formation and implementation of the university's strategic plan. We're in the process of starting a new strategic plan. Shared governance not only forms the, the strategic plan, but it also goes into its implementation. And we spend a lot of time talking about this. You cannot divor divorce shared governance from the strategic plan. And the final recommendation um, is to the continuation and expansion of our task force to include senior administrators and board of trustees members. Um, that's our third recommendation, but it's not the final word. Oh, yes, it, I have one more slide, I'm sorry. John has the final word. I have one more, which is our challenges and opportunities. So as been, has been noted already, we actually are facing many challenges ahead, some of which were noted by President Henderson's February 11th letter to the community. But we would like to see these challenges as presenting opportunities, opportunities for implementing our principles, um, implementing our expectations and implementing our recommendations that we have presented here today. So they're, they're linked. Her letter and what we're seeing today are linked. And then you have the final say. All right, I, I'm tempted to say what we were calling this slide. All right, so, so then I will, because I'm tempted to. Um, we were, we were calling this the slide of hope, which is the last slide. Um, however, it's, 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 it's comical, but it's really not funny. It's something that we really need to address. Um, so NJCU's 2020 strategic plan should be a living document. So what do we mean by that? Um, think about that. So a living document, what is a living document? All right, it not only helps to shape who we are, but we shape the document as well. Um, we've had committees work on our previous strategic doc, um, plan. I'm sure many of you are in the room now, all the work that went into that. Um, but I'll give you um, an example from myself with the strategic plan. Often I am not referring to the strategic plan unless I am doing my fiscal year reporting. And then I am doing my measurables, and then I'm saying well, this goes here, this goes to this, this goes to that. How often do we refer to the strategic plan when doing our daily operations of students, of curricula. How often do we refer to that? How often do we let it guide us, but how often do we also look at the document and see how we can guide it moving forward? So moving forward, the document could be something that we are not reactionary to, but are pumping life into the document to ensure that our goals as an institution are being met in the document, not only in the document, but in everything we do here to help our students um, and even the civilian shared governance of the university. Um, the next point, when shared governance and civility serve as the core values of the institution and the strategic plan, our capacity to achieve our mission is strengthened. Um, I think this speaks for itself. 
Um, if what we are doing today is laying the foundation, um, now it's very easy to look back and again, point fingers and say this needs to be done, this needs to be done. Um, many, of, many people would say, well, we had some dark times, you know, that, we just, you know, that we've gone through. Um, but it's not going to help us moving forward. We can reflect on that and see what, we can done, what can be done better. And I feel like that's what we're doing today by looking at this great college workforce survey and seeing what needs to be done in these two areas. And I wonder if that was a blessing in disguise that has got us to this point. Um, so now we can strengthen our university and ourselves within the university. Um, again, that sounds like the slide of hope. Um, but we're here for a reason, and we do need to move forward. So there you go. Um, now, we have references here. I know the one that's going to be given out will have an appendix with all of the survey results. Um, so, you know, please feel free to look through that. Um, and on that note, we'll open the floor for questions. Which I'm not answering alone. because I want y'all to feel what I feel about right now. Again, my name is Chevy Thomas. I am Madam Chapter President of this great, esteemed New Jersey City University. We house housekeepings, we house um, grounds, we house repairers, senior repairers, craftsmen. We do all the work. We have the head, which is the third floor. You are the body, but we are the arms and the legs that keep everything going on on this campus. I stand before you because I feel sad. I have chapter president for C, I'm sorry, branch presidents for CWA that sits on the committee. I have the AFT president that sits on the committee. But not one time this president was invited to sit on these committees. You stand up here and say, be accountable. You said mutual respect. You said structure. You said input. You don't give us none of that. When you come here in the morning, we're not perfect, but we work to try to be professional. When you cut your lights on, your office are clean. When you want it clean. We are the ones that chase. We pay an exterminator, but we do the exterminator work. <laughs> Bathrooms, you don't have to worry about, even though people like to be disrespectful. But we go in there and do our job. We answer every emergency. We do moving jobs. There's so much we do, but we are not accountable. We're not a part of this committee, and we should have every right to say what we feel. Students work more with us than they do with you. They respect us more than us than they do with you. We're their mothers and their fathers. We're their counselors. But nobody hears us. If you allow us to sit at the table, you will know this. I had to stand and say this because we are never accountable. And I'm letting you know how I feel that I was not invited to be a part of any of this committee. Thank you. Any more questions? Stand up, say your name. John Oswitz, we need the mic. Okay, wait, wait, somebody will take the mic. Thank you. Joe Moskowitz, political science. And NJC, you activist, I say, would say you may call me. So I'm very concerned about the results of those surveys. And I certainly applaud the committee for having gathered that information. 
But I have a question unrelated to that. Has there been a review of the standards that are established in middle states in regard to governance and in regard specifically to the role of the Board of Trustees? And the reason I ask that question is though I applaud and I individually support many of the recommendations, as co-chair of Standard 7's um, part of the Middle States self-study, there is a defined role for the Board of Trustees. Now, I think we ought to do many of the things that you mentioned, but there's also, you've got to be careful, there's a line. And it specifically says, Middle States Standard says that the Board of Trustees shall not be involved with the day-to-day -day operations of the institution. So you have to be careful about some of those recommendations not going beyond that line because that, in fact, would jeopardize some of the accreditation things that we're about to go through. Well taken. Were, were, were they considered in your suggestions and analysis? Did well, you look at the middle state standard on governance in this regard? And rest assured, you know how I feel about shared governance. Boy, am I a supporter. So was that considered? So no, we did not consider middle states. We stayed away from it. We stayed, we stayed away from it. I think we did consider it. Uh, we didn't look at the middle states. We did consider it. We did consider it. We didn't look specifically at the middle states requirement. We weren't uh, referring to Board of Trustees involvement in the day-to-day -day activities. We were, that was not our intention. Our intention was to have a more, um, a more, uh, a more a, a relationship, some at least a relationship. What we came what we came out with in the survey we took was that most everyone, it was a very high percentage. I'm saying 80 percent or something had no idea who was on the board of trustees, how many people were on the board of trustees, what qualifications were for them to be on the board of trustees. So we felt that there was a real disconnect between the faculty, staff, uh, and and the board of trustees, and that was where we were going with. Uh, what we were really headed towards was something like listening and learning luncheons. What, what's done at Stockton and TCNJ is they do these, and it was started by the Board of Trustees, uh, where once a month they came to campus and just to listen to what some of the issues were, some of the challenges and obstacles that faculty and staff were dealing with. And this helped to inform them as they made decisions and, um, and, and it put a face to a name and it gave it gave a sense of trust and, and relationship building, and that's where we were going. Thank you, Joe. There's one up front here. There's one right here. Right here. Thank you. Um, certainly, um, I want to say I heard you, Sherry, and your impassioned plea to be a part of the discussions. You have just as much right as any of us to at least be a part of the dialogue. But I want to, first off, let me applaud the two committees. What an excellent presentation that you both brought forward. However, with regard particularly to shared governance, which I believe encompasses civility, I'm wondering if you thought about giving more precise directions, timelines. And, and I'll tell you what I mean by that as quickly as I can. I would hope, I mean, I have my, I yield to the Senate president here and also my fellow senator. But one of the things that we have been trying to do in addition to have administrative evaluations We've sent written requests to the board to have a dialogue with the board, not about operations, but just a dialogue with the board to tell them what the experiences were as we perceived them as Senate members. 
The board has failed to respond to us, telling us that they're not required to do so, which I respect, but it would seem to me that you would want to do those things. And so I'm wondering, I hear and I see you say the Senate member committee should meet more regularly, blah, but I, I want to know going forward, will there be specific directions of how we move closer to shared governance? Because until that time, my responses will always be reactionary rather than being a part of having those issues resolved before the mandate, which would avoid that incivil or lack of civility that results when I feel as though something is being imposed rather than me being a part of the decision-making process. I remind people all the time, I only have one vote, but that vote still counts. Okay, great. That's a great question. Um, our task force was charged with the charges that we mentioned here. Our timeline was to end in, I think our initial, our initial timeline was December. Then it moved to what we thought was late January and then into February. Um, so our charge is to do the research, do the background, come up with what shared governance is for NJCU whether we achieved that today or came close to it is, is open for debate and again, shared governance. Um, however, our charge was to do the research and lay the foundation. One of our recommendations was to move forward with a shared governance task force. Um, at that time, I can only assume that we will have timelines. We will have more specific um, charges, not only charges, but action items. And, and I'm sure reactionary items as well on the, the ethos and, and of the university and also you know the shared governance and that, which is part of all of that. Um, so I hope I've answered your question that we, the timeline is something that is forthcoming that we are recommending that we continue our work. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to respond to Gloria's uh, question also, because I think that our presentations laid a foundation and the groundwork, um, but the, as my grandmother would say, the proof is in the pudding, and it's what we do, uh, it's really what we do after this that I think is, uh, that is important. And that's why both committees asked for the continuation of their uh, of their commit uh, of their work, um, and that's an interesting issue because technically our charge ends today. Our charge was to make this presentation, um, and so we're going to ask to be recharged, and uh, and there may be other people who'd like to uh, like to join uh, the committee um, also. And so whatever the actions or the timelines that are taken, um, those committees um, will uh, will decide. Uh, but there are things that I would think about, that I would think about uh, because two things were um, focused on here, and one is budget having a voice in budgetary issues, and the second is the strategic uh, the strategic plan. And in some ways, the self study that was uh, done, and everybody should read the self study. There are many more activities going on with dedicated people than we we get to see in our particular. Uh, in our particular spheres, but it has very much an aspirational uh, dimension to it because it's organized around the the 2013 self study. You know, to what to what extent we did did we do this, that, or the other? And I, I think it going forward, it could be give us much more direction in in determining uh, initiatives. So a, a self government governing task force. Um, the formation of the 2013 strategic plan struck me as an example of shared governance. There were lots of faculty on those committees. But the shared government task force could bring the members of the faculty and the staff uh, together to see what each group was doing and how active self-governance was embedded not only as a process but as a goal in the uh, in, in the strategic uh, plan. The uh, groups going forward could organize groups in schools. You know, to what extent should the 
strategic plan reflect what you're doing? How does the strategic plan indicate what you might do in the, in the future? And so um, it, it could have those kinds of, uh, those, those kinds of forums uh, around the notion that the strategic plan should be shared governments, not only in the formation, but in the implementation and the uh, assessment. Uh, and when it comes to budget, I'd just like to quote from the uh, musical Hamilton. Um, I want to be in the room where it happens. <laughs> Thanks. Gloria, you're, uh, that part about the Board of Trustees not meeting us, that was a big part of our discussion, and we were debating how specific to get in, and one of our conclusions was that uh, nothing really substantive could happen, uh, well, more substantive things could happen if we can continue. So if we're not allowed to continue, um, we had very little hope that any of our specific um, goal, goals would be listened to. Uh, I do want to take an opportunity to thank President Henderson for, for today. Um, it takes a big risk to, to charge these committees. Uh, in the back of our mind, we always suspected something, uh, I don't want to be cynical, but that this might not get pulled off, but this is uh, for real. We're meeting, we're sharing, no one interfered in what we were going to say, uh, no one tried to, so I think that was, uh, that was good, so thank you. Uh, um, yeah, and also one other thing, I, I think when we, when we gave our final recommendations, that part about the board not meeting the Senate Executive Committee, to me, growingly seem more like a symptom than a, than a problem, and I think our recommendations address that. So, thank you. Um, before we, I know we're running out of time, I just want to make um, a clarification to Sherry's concern about feeling excluded, and are deeply sorry that you feel that way, but we want to just reiterate how the task force selection process was constituted. The administration did not want to have the, be involved in a process of appointing someone, so what we did, we sent out an email that members of the committee could be nominated or even be self-nominated. And anyone that I believe was nominated or self-nominated served. So there may be some misunderstanding about how the task force composition was derived. But in no way was the administration handpicked anyone. So it was a nomination, an open nomination process where people nominated and people couldn't self-nominate. So I just want to make that clarification. Um, if there's no further questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the task force. I want to thank the chairs. I want to thank the champions. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank those who are watching on YouTube. Um, I want to thank everyone to participate in these two, these were two made, these were tough decision points and that's why we chose them, shared governance and civility. And as um, Chris said, in no way the administration tried to influence the outcome. In many ways we were just spectators to this process. So I'm glad that these, these two committees, these two task forces presentation concluded today. And we understand that it doesn't end today, but it's the beginning of what we see of subsequent conversations. So once again, I want to thank everyone for participating. Thank you for those viewers on YouTube. And we hope to continue this conversation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you once again.